Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage here in New York City at our new location, the New York Stock Exchange in collaboration with the NYSE Wired community. We're bringing you all the content here on the East Coast. This is our East Coast access point to the network of great experts and all the data coming out of theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, and I'm joined here with Scott Hepner, who's our new research analyst at theCUBE Research. As you know, siliconangle.com is where we have our publication and media, thecube.net is our video, and thecuberesearch.com is where our bench of seasoned industry analysts are breaking new stories and new research every day, and we're going to talk about a new note that Scott has done. Scott, welcome to theCUBE here in our location in, the, in New York. Thank you for having me, this is great. This is your uh, backyard. It is. Uh, we've known each other for years. Uh, you were executive multiple decades at IBM, mm -hmm. uh, product, marketing, all across the gamut of uh, many transformation journeys. Uh, we're yes. super excited to have you on the SiliconANGLE Media CUBE team on the CUBE Research, right. uh, heading up uh, and doing a lot of AI, digging into AI, the AI industry research. All of our big customers are going to love the ad advisory and all the reports. I saw your first one, we'll talk about it now. Uh, so great work, just a lot of great stuff. Thank you, this is going to be a lot of fun. L like the scene here, this is, I the, love it. This yeah. is the center of capitalism yeah. in New York City. And of course, Palo Alto is the center of technology, but New York has, has a huge renaissance in technology. I mean, IBM, storied history, uh, yeah. Tom Watson, they were the computer industry. Hewlett Packard on the West Coast. So I feel like IBM, HP, kind of with that East Coast, West Coast, kind of founders of tech. The New York scene here is pretty amazing. And um, you see a lot of big tech companies coming here. Uh, a couple cycles ago, it was mostly Massachusetts, but now you got Silicon Valley, New York. So it's booming, and a lot of them talking about AI. And, and this week is even more impressive because the UN's here for the General Assembly, yeah. and you got Climate Week. So the theme is really governance, big global issues from supply chain to governing AI to, mm -hmm you know, how do we make the earth better? And we've had great customers on, Google brought like four customers, so again, Google Cloud, thanks for them for coming on, but it's been a great week, I and mean, this, is, this is an AI dream scenario where yes. both the back end and the front end are being upended with disruptive enablers, mm -hmm. and there's a lot going on on both sides of the equation, and you got to do both to be successful. That's absolutely right, and you're right about, you know, the tech renaissance here in New York is definitely happening, I mean, you know, you mentioned IBM, they just opened a beautiful new building, you know, in, in New York City. So, you know, renovating their presence here, and then you have all these startups here, and like you mentioned, what's going on at the UN. Uh, and AI touches all this, right? I mean, talk about climate and sustainability, well, the energy costs alone, for at least today's AI models, um, is pretty dramatic. And well, well, I got to say, when we announced that you were coming on board, I know that a lot of people in our community and the tech industry were very energized about you joining the team. You've had a passion for AI for a long time. Yeah. Um, you've been looking at the new frontier of AI. Yes. Uh, what's shaping your views? Well, I, th I think we're very much in the infancy of AI. I mean, like really in the infancy here. And it's unbelievably impressive what can be done today, but it's really only the start, I think. And I, I think there's some trends that are starting to develop now that are going to converge over time into more of an architectural approach. And I think that is the notion of causal AI, the actual ability to reason, problem solve, mm -hmm. you know, understand cause and effect. I think the long tail of the small language model is going to become more and more dominant. And when you say small language model, you can actually substitute the X for, or the S for sovereign, secure, specialized, small, Right? If you think about all that, it becomes increasingly important if you want to optimize your model for your unique business, your unique clients, your region, right? So I think that one. And then Agentic AI, this notion of yeah. a bunch of network agents that are collaborating together to actually solve problems. Take all those things together, and while the pieces are there today, and of course you mix in things like generative AI and so on, large language models, um, what's missing today is the architectural confluence of all that into, yeah. and that's what I think is going to start to shape the next two to four years. Yeah, so. I totally love that. And they got the building blocks. It's almost like an operating system is needed to kind of, at a runtime, kind of make things happen and, and, and generate uh, action. Right. I love your comment about SLMs for small language model, but substituting S for those multiple faceted categories. Right. Uh, it's interesting, LLMs, large language models, is another, another term that people use large language models when actually they've been called frontier models because it's yeah. not just language, it's computer vision, so it's multimodal. So I like how you went multifaceted at the, at, with the S. 
Because sovereign cloud, for instance, is, is an issue. You mentioned sovereign, secure. Yep. Data relevance and data quality is different based upon the situation it's needed in. This seems yeah. to be the pocket of area where you start to see people not freak out about, but pay attention to. Right. Like a small language or SLM could be, I have a small data set for security, mm -hmm. or if I don't have a small data set, someone else might have it. Right. We have a small cube set, but might want to use that. So this is where models start to get involved with each other. Yeah, you can kind of go back to the fundamentals, the principles or the tenets, if you will, of, of AI in business, right? It needs to understand the unique language of your business. It's going to be used for automation of your processes, your workflows, how your customers interact, how you engage with the world, which is always unique yeah. for a business, and it's got to be trusted, yeah. right? And trust is a lot of different words from sovereign to, to secure, but explainable, you know, how and why did you do this kind of, kind of thing. So you take those three things and yeah, you get into this idea of the, of the SLM. You, you can actually throw in small too, yeah. right? As being what most people say, but I think it's more about specialized and tend to be behind the firewall. Yeah. And by the way, they feed off the LLMs. So it's not like either or, it's, it's architecturally going to come together. Yeah, I think our, the work that the Cube Research did, uh, me and Dave and the team with the power law is actually, that was two years ago, is actually playing out to be relevant. Um, I want to get into the, your research that you mm -hmm. just put in and, and what you're working on. So I think folks are hungry for advisory and navigating through the, the innovation cycle we're in. Um, but before we do that, I want to get your take on something because knowing your history, um, you've seen many innovation waves yes. over the years. Transformational. Mm -hmm. What's the big transformational set of things that people need to pay attention to now from your perspective. Looking back at your experience of um, transformational waves, it's, we've seen the movie before, but it's different every time, but now it's even more different because of the, the relevance of the back end, front end. What are you seeing, what, what does your experience tell you about the current state of this wave of generative AI and all the impact operationally to user experience to societal change? Well, since I've been around the scene, which is almost 30, or 30 years or so, <laughs> going all the way back to, you know, yeah. God knows how long ago, kind of reminds me of like the Game of Thrones, mo multiple seasons. To me, it's been one big transformation where we start off by interconnecting everything, then we instrumented everything, and now we're in that phase of infusing intelligence. So the, the three eyes, right? And there's been some, like you said, it's the same movie or plot, just different characters and there's some common characteristics to each one of these phases, I think. And I think what we're seeing today is some, you know, again, common phases is that there's not going to be a one size fits all. It's not going to be dominated by one player. And open standards, open technology that allows you to wire these things together is what's in the end going to dominate. So there's a whole, you know, focus these days on open source models versus closed source models. Are they direct, indirect on how you consume them, the pricing models and all that. And if you look at the long tail of these models, and I think um, Hugging Face has, is approaching a million, a million models yeah. on that site. And then by the way, there's not just, there's two sides of the coin. There's the marketplace around models, and then there's the marketplace around AI data sets, which are two sides of the same coin. And they're both developing at rapid speed in terms of marketplaces, right? And so how you wire these thing, things together, and that's why I'm on this notion of architectural approach. And it happened with the cloud era, it happened with e-business, and it happened with client server, where you start off with the piece parts, and then they start to come together, and then before you know it, parts of it commoditize out, like the browsers, yeah. are the large language models going to become the browsers of the future? And I'm talking not this yeah. year, next year, yeah. but. Yeah, their know. role in, in the infrastructure of this user experience. Right, That's right. what you're getting. Okay, I great. think the value over time is going to be more, not in these large language models from the big, the closed source yeah. ones, but it's going to be in this, the, the SLMs. Yeah, and I like, I like your uh, stance on Agentic. As you know, we all on our team, the Cube Research, right. love the Agentic wave. We think it's going to be rele very relevant to SaaS. A category is going to change that category significantly, so we'll see some innovation there. Uh, and then guests we've been having on the Cube here in New York City because of Climate Week is they're solving problems with cloud scale, with the hyper, hyper, uh, hyper scalers, and with supercomputing-like capabilities being democratized. Mm -hmm. They're solving new hard problems that are categorically new. Right. That they couldn't do before without specialized high performance computing. So you're seeing a whole nother category at the top of the stack, large scale problems, and then SaaS evolving to Agentic. I just yes. see the application security, the application platform paradigm, that movie's happening with agents. But this new category, 
Mm -hmm. We heard the uh, ex-Stanford um, um, scientists formed Atlas AI. You met them in the, prior to coming on yeah. here. They're solving, they're building an earth instrumentation engine right. to solve logistics and supply chain. Right. They're doing two things. <laughs> Those are hard things, <laughs> but they can do it with Google Cloud. Right. They're, custom, they're, they're cloud providers. So again, it's just a beautiful time right. to do this. Yep. What's your research doing now? Take us through your research uh, that's coming out and then what's, what's down the pipe? Well, you just said the key word, they're solving. They're solving, they're, they're solving. problem solving, right? And I think one of the challenges with today's large language models and generative AI in general is that it's based on a correlative design. It correlates across, it basically swims in a large data lake and correlates to identify patterns, associations, right, anomalies, and they can then predict or forecast or generate something, right? It, it can do the what, it can tell you what, but it can't tell you how it went about deciding that's the right answer, and doesn't can't tell you how to do it, and it doesn't do a good job at it telling you why that is the best option among others, right? So think of the design point today, it's, it's based on statistical probabilities. Probabilities tell you our beliefs in a static world, based on past historical experience or data, yeah. right? Causality tells you how those probabilities change when the world around you changes. For AI to help human beings actually problem solve and plan, it needs to understand causality in the science of why things happen. And that's what causal AI is all about. And it starts out with the notion of reasoning. Can, like, everyone knows today's can't reason. Open AI just came out with their O1 model, and they proclaim that it starts to allow you to AI that reasons. And I think it's a big advancement on the journey to AI reasoning systems, but it's really, the journey has just begun because it does not understand cause and effect. So reasoning right now is just reasoning off statistical calculations and causal AI you're suggesting, which is your research area, is going to be where the, where the action is. I think that's going to be complementary in, the, in, the, in yeah. the roadmap ahead. So the, the way I would frame it from a technical perspective is they came out with this new technology called uh, chain of thought. So in, in, in terms of, you know, for mere mortal thinking, <laughs> basically what it does is it looks at a complex problem, like a math problem. It breaks that problem down into what's called COT tokens. And then it starts to assemble those and process them to solve the problem. But then it will go back in time, reevaluate its previous steps. It spends a lot of time reasoning going back Reinforcement learning is behind the scenes, both uh, in, in what it does, as well as human you know, feedback into it. And over time, it gets stronger and stronger to solving these problems. But what, what's neat about it is it will go back and reevaluate the problems and do things differently. And it takes a lot of time in inferencing to do that. So it's actually reasoning, but you're right, it's still based on a statistical model. Really sophisticated, very uh, compute intensive to do it. And even, oh, if, even if you go ask ChatGPT01, do, do you understand cause and effect? It will tell you no. So therefore, it's a step in the right direction. And by the way, there's others yeah. doing it, like DeepMind, right? They have a thing called star self-taught yeah. reasoning or something like that. It's the same concept, but to me, it's a building block on a longer journey to systems that will actually be able to reason, reason being defined as, at some point, you have to understand cause and effect. So take us through some of your research you're putting out now. What can people expect? Well, I think what's happening now is you have the advancements in, as we said before, the SLMs. So they're becoming more specialized. There's data sets that are coming along with that. You got the whole agentic AI thing that's you know maturing at a rapid pace too. Um, and you have these technologies that are slowly but surely going to start to allow these AI models to do a better job of reasoning. Open AI with their chain of thought is one of the building blocks. At the same time, there's a new market developing called causal, the causal AI market. And depending on who you look at, I think the consensus for you, it's about a 40 to 50% compounded growth rate between now and 2030. I think it's going to get up close to at least a billion dollars, but some of the estimates are a little bit less. I think, it define, I think it comes down, how do you define it? But if you define it in terms of vendors or companies that are providing new tools, new methods, and new platforms, it's about a 40% growth rate, and there's, I don't know, 10 or 12 companies out there today that are you know, doing quite well, 
And you know, you're hearing it, you heard it in some of the interviews today that people are starting to, to do this. So I think that starts to get fused together and there's, I'm gonna write another research note. My next one will be about all the different methods that, that under the umbrella of causal AI. And then again, architecturally they come yeah. together. All right, well I really appreciate you coming in on this day and getting, getting the update on the research. Obviously we love what we do. Um, we do a lot more CUBE interviews together uh, with Dave Vellante uh, and the team. And again, this is going to be an area that's going to open up its aperture big time. Yeah. Um, take a minute to talk to the audience about um, what you're looking for, um, who you want to engage with, kind of briefings you're doing, how do folks engage with you, who do you want to talk to. Um, take a minute to uh, put a plug in for what you're working on and how people can connect and, and add value and collaborate with you. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things that, that um, I pride myself on over the years is I have a big network of experts. They're business leaders, they're technologists. I love engaging across that no network. I want to continue to build it. Because my view is, um, you know, strategy is only as good as the insights and the consensus it's built upon. And never think alone, never go it alone. So I love to build partnerships with people and learn from them. And I'm going to focus these initially on, as you kind of pointed out, the next frontier of AI. What you need to start preparing for now to be ready in the next year or two. There's a lot of people talking about Gen AI. There's, you know, I want to try to fill that spot that don't be, don't be a laggard in the next phase. And the movement around AI reasoning and causal AI, I think is not only necessary, but it's inevitable. I mean, people are going to want to problem their AI to help them problem solve. It's going to happen. Guaranteed, 100%. So you look, you're look, looking for experts to add to your network. What about companies out there? Uh, you're looking for certain kinds of companies, and and if they're watching, what are what what's going on in their world that would in, uh, motivate them to contact you to engage? Yeah, well, one is, do you want to you know get some um, insights into where this is all heading? Two is, do you, do you want to get introduced and understand the 12 or so platform companies that are now building causal capabilities. There's another whole wave of dozens of companies that are like pharmaceutical and so on that are infusing causal. We just met one for sustainability, yeah. right? I'd like to learn more about what they're doing and how we can help them, right? And then finally, um, any company, business, that's actually starting to use this to learn from and where we can help. And again, there's a ton of companies. Uh, causal Lens just had a conference in the UK, yes, about two days ago. They had 26 businesses there showing off what they're doing with Causeway AI. So this is all happening, and I want to engage across that community yeah. that is doing it to learn, and then take that learning and transfer it to other companies that want to start to get involved. And just yeah. one final question, the speed of acceleration here is scope the speed of the change. You mentioned causal uh, event that you, you uh, attended. Yeah. What's the speed like? What's the pace of play? I think it's real now. I think there's a lot of experimentation. There's real use cases that have real ROI that have already been achieved by uh, many pioneers. I would say the next couple of years is when it's really going to accelerate. I'll tell you, the Gartner, if you look at the Gartner um, hype, uh, they have it as a high impact technology in the two, I think the two to four year time frame. I think it's going to be a little quicker than that. Yeah. Um, and things like what OpenAI just did, it's just going to be a spark for people yeah. to think more about, like, wow, it do, do these things don't reason. <laughs> so if you're a company, you got to act now, contact Scott. Of course, the cuberesearch.com is the site. Go check out uh, under the research piece, the content's being published. It's all free, we have free insights, of course, we do engagements, and of course they host on theCUBE, and again, we're bringing the real time, high frequency insights as best we can to you. It's our mission here at theCUBE and SiliconANGLE Media and theCUBE Research, so uh, we do our best, engage with us, we love your support, and again, love the collaboration, okay? Thanks for watching here. It's our NYSC location, CUBE East. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Scott Hebner, AI analyst with CUBE Research. Thanks for watching.